Okay. Uh, let's see. Kevin, would you open up with the Lord's Prayer? Sure. Let's pray, gentlemen. Amun Dwashman, the Kadeshmak, Te Te Malkutha, Nikwe Soyan, Ekana Dwashmea, Ak Bara, Halan Lakmadis and Kwanan Yomana, Waswoklan Habin, Ekana Dup, Kanan Shwakan, the Highway, Utlan Lunciona, Ella Pasan and Bisha, Mato de Laki Malkuta, Ukaila, Utis La Alam Amin. Father, we're thankful Jim is healthy again tonight, Lord, that you would continue to be with Russell as he rehabs and just continue to keep us all safe and seeking after your word, Lord. We ask these things in thy son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I am going to bring that up Aramaic. Pardon me? Was that Aramaic? Yes. That was yeah. right out of Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. Oh, okay. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Uh, let me find out where we are here. Um. <clears throat> here we go. I'm going to bring up a page from a Facebook group called Modern Biblical Scholarship. I am one of the administrators of that group. And this is a post that uh, recently was put on there. Uh, it's one of Bart Ehrman's, and I posted it. Are Christian apologists being, just being dishonest? What do you think? And um, I posted that, and I'm going to show it to you so you can actually see what Bart had to say. <laughs> A number of people have recently asked me virtually the same question about my debates with conservative Christian apologists. In my opinion, when these people say things that don't seem to make any sense, are they being dishonest? Or do they genuinely believe what they say? I'll give my opinion and then ask yours. I'll give an example from an event that some people have asked about. It was an apologetics conference hosted by an evangelical group. The attendees were almost entirely committed evangelical Christians. Normally at this kind of event, the organizers only have representatives of their own views who give their thoughts, talks to prove and affirm that their religious views are right. But for this conference, they decided to have another voice represented, and that voice was me. I had a great time. Two of the other speakers, Mike Lacona and Craig Keener, were already friends of mine. A third I had never met before. We disagree up to and down the, the line on almost everything connected with religion in general, and the New Testament in particular, but I consider Mike and Craig to be good and sincere people. The crowd was very welcoming and we all had some good laughs. In their presentations, the three of them argued that the gospels do not have any bona fide contradictions. They each had different ways to approach the issue. I argued that they have contradictions up and down the line. We all tried to support our views. After we had made our presentations, there was a panel discussion in which the moderator appealed to one specific issue to see how we would each address it. It's minor, but intriguing difference between the gospels. In Mark, Jesus sends the 12 disciples out on a mission to preach the coming kingdom, and he instructs them not to take anything with them, no bread, bag, or money, except a staff. That's in Mark 6, verse 8. Matthew has the same passage. And here, I'll show you the passage. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. Okay, and that's from the ESV. Matthew has the same passage, but in his account, Jesus says the opposite. The disciples are not to take a staff. 
In Matthew, it says, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff. For the laborer deserves his food. And so the moderator asked us, which did Jesus really say? Take a staff or not? My view was and is that the episode may not have happened at all. But if it did happen, then obviously Matthew and Mark can't both be right. Jesus either said to take a staff or not to take a staff. Craig and the other presenter tried to explain that even though this may seem to be a contradiction, in fact, it wasn't. I can't remember how they explained it. I think when I was a conservative evangelical, I probably said the event happened twice. Once when Jesus said to take a staff and the other time not. But Mike took a different line. He said that Mark correctly reported what Jesus said and Matthew changed or reversed Jesus's instructions. Then it got even more interesting. The moderator asked if we thought Matthew's account was inerrant. Craig and the other fellow, since they don't see a contradiction, said Matthew does not contain an error. And then somewhat to my surprise, Mike too said that Matthew was inerrant. So in his view, Matthew reports the opposite, both of what Jesus actually said and reverses what Mark correctly in Mike's view reports he said. But that is not an error. I was a bit incredulous. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what Jesus said and you read Matthew, you would think that he said the opposite of what he really did say. How could that not be a contradiction of Mark? And if Mark is right in what Jesus said, Matthew is wrong. How could that not be an error? Mike had an explanation. In his view, Matthew was fully cognizant of what he was doing when he changed Mark's account. This was standard practice among ancient biographers to alter accounts they had inherited when they wanted to emphasize one point or another. Since Matthew was doing it on purpose, it was not an error. I suppose on one <laughs> level, that might kind of sort of make sense. In, his, in this view, Matthew didn't make an unconscious mistake. He made a deliberate alteration. But well, really? It's not an error? It gives a false report of what Jesus said. Sure seems like an error to me, whether Matthew meant to contradict Mark or just did it by accident. In my view, it's just this. If I give you a piece of false information, for example, if I say that after he lost the election in 1980, Jimmy Carter divorced his wife, Rosalind, which he did not, then, well, it's not true. It's an error. <laughs> Maybe I simply made a mistake. I thought they had gotten a divorce, but I was wrong. Or maybe I intentionally said that they did it because I had some agenda or wanted to make a point. But in either case, whether I say it on purpose or by accident, my report is wrong. You would not say that my statement was inerrant. Or more simply, if you ask someone for directions and they intentionally give you the wrong ones, would you say, <clears throat> that the directions are completely accurate without error since the person had reasons for what he said or she said. I'm just giving one solitary example out of a hundred that could be made. Apologists often insist on views that make others not in their camp scratch their heads. If you're in the camp of head scratchers, you know what I mean and no doubt can cite far better examples of your own. I picked this one simply because it's fairly easy to explain. But the question I've been asked is this, do I think apologists who say such things really believe them or are they being dishonest, knowing full well that they can't be right but insisting they are because in the end that will in their view lead to a better result, the conversion of unbelievers. My personal sense, is that whatever their deep conscious is telling them below the surface, they really believe on the surface at least in their heads what they say 
and do not think they are presenting falsehoods. That is, I personally suspect that all of the time, most of the time, they are not being dishonest or at least trying to be dishonest. That's what they say is what they genuinely believe. At least I think that's what I think. <laughs> but what do you think? All right, so that's Mark. All right, so back to the Facebook page. Um, Ken, who couldn't be with us tonight because he's not feeling well, so keep Ken in your prayers. Um, he says, I haven't looked at Greek or Aramaic versions yet. So this is an answer to the general question of consistency in the English translations of Mark 6 and Matthew 10. Checking the King James only, there is an objective difference in the instructions as quoted in Bart's blog. However, does the difference change the meaning of the verse, which I think uh, is earning a fair wage? I'm inclined to think the major points of Mark and Matthew are consistent in the grand scheme. So we need to establish the criteria for inconsistency for this genre of literature. Without a working definition, the question of inconsistency is ill-posed. Unless they are photocopies, there will be numerous objective differences. Regardless, they may still convey the same message subjectively. I'm listening to Reza Aslan's No God But God. Reza wrote that asking is what the prophet recited was the actual word of God. That's in the Quran he's referring to here. Is not the right question. The right question is, what does it mean? I think that argument underlies the Christian apologist response. Does the instruction regarding the staff change the meaning of the passage? If not, they are effectively consistent for um, intents and purposes. Now, uh, I, I wrote this in my response. On the one hand, yeah, think of the fiddle, fiddler on the roof here, okay? On the one hand, it is important to see exactly what the text says. That's step one. Matthew says one thing, Mark says something different. We need to know that. And that is for accurate copying of the text as a starting point. However, I agree that the major points of Mark and, Ma and Matthew are consistent in the grand scheme, and we need to establish our particular criteria for interpretation. I doubt that the text means more than travel light and let the people you serve take care of you in the tradition of Near Eastern hospitality. But I wouldn't want to paraphrase the text as such, but merely to provide an interpretation. I also believe Aslan's comment on what does it mean is the most important question. And then I also said, by the way, this is, I think, very important to this issue. The question in Bart's post only becomes real significant when one is arguing for or against a position of inerrancy. One can and should, in my opinion, view the biblical text as extremely important and inspired but not inerrant and not always technically precise. If one believes the texts have to be inerrant and precise, then one with an open mind will cease to accept them. However, when we understand how the texts were written and transmitted over time, we can appreciate their value without placing unreasonable requirements upon them. All right, so that's that's a lot. That's a lot to think about. Does anyone have any questions or comments at this time? Yes, sir. Question on how the text was written. Um, how was it written differently? How was it written differently? Yeah. Well, specifically, the issue that they're making is in one text, it says take a staff, and the other text, it says specifically, do not take a staff. Oh. Move your water glass, Russell. So um, that's, the, that's the major issue. 
that they're making from that, that point. Now, <coughs> fundamentalists will argue that the Bible's inerrant. So they've got to figure out a way to make it right in both cases, even though it doesn't agree. And critics of the Bible will say that proves that the Bible's not inerrant, and therefore you can't trust it. I think both of those extremes are incorrect. So let me give you an example why, which it uh, goes right in with tonight's um, sequence in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 26. And I am now going to bring up a page that our friend um, Eric started. And this is, um, this is all from Dr. Lambs's translation. And let me just check with you and see, is this clear enough? Is the type big enough that you can read it? No. All right, let me see what I can do about that. Can he eat this? What? Can he eat this? Yeah. Yeah, let me find it. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So here's Matthew chapter 26. Thank you. Beginning in verse 6. When Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vessel of precious perfume. And she poured it upon the head of Jesus while he was reclining. When the disciples saw it, they were displeased and said, why this waste? For it could have been sold for a great sum and given to the poor. But, the, but Jesus understood it and said to them, why are you troubling the woman? She has done a good work to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not have me always. But this one who poured the perfume on my body did it as for my burial. And truly, I say to you, whenever this, my gospel, is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then we have in Mark. We have. When Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, while he reclined, there came a woman who had with her an alabaster vessel of perfume, <coughs> excuse me, of pure nard, of good quality and very expensive. And she opened it and poured it upon the head of Jesus. But there were some men of the disciples who were displeased with them, themselves and said, why was this perfume wasted? For it could have been sold for more than 300 pennies given to the poor, and they were indignant at her. For you always have the poor with you, and when you wish, you can do good with them or to them, but I am not always with you. But this one has done it with what she had. She anointed my body in advance as for the burial, and I truly say to you, Wherever this, my gospel, is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And then we have a Luke. Then one of the Pharisees came and asked him to eat with him. And he entered the house of that Pharisee and reclined as a guest. Now there was in that city a woman who was a sinner and when she knew that he was a guest in the Pharisee's house, she took an alabaster cruise of perfume, stood behind him at his feet with her tears and to wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he reasoned in himself and said, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who she is and her reputation. For the woman who touched him is a sinner. Jesus answered, saying, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said to him, say it, teacher. Jesus said, there were two men who were debtors to a certain creditor. One of them owed him 500 pence, 
and the other 50 pence. And because they had nothing to pay, he forgave them both. Which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, saying, I think the one to whom he forgave more. Jesus said to him, you have judged truly. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me even water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not kiss me, but she has since she entered has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, I say to you, her many sins are forgiven because she has loved much. But he to whom little is forgiven loves little. And he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Then the guests began to say within themselves, who is this man who forgives even sins? So Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay, now we have another version in the Gospel of John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazar, that's the Aramaic, Lazarus, is what you're familiar with, uh, where he was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And they gave him a banquet there. Martha served, but Lazar was one of the guests who were with him. Then Mary took a cruise containing pure and expensive nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled <coughs> with the fragrance of the perfume. And Judah of Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, why was not this oil sold for 300 pennies and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And the purse was with him, and he carried whatever was put into it. Jesus then said, let her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial, for you have the poor always with you. But me, you have not always. All right, now we have in four different Gospels, we have what appears to be the same incident. And each Gospel writer tells the story a little differently. Matthew and Mark are very similar. It occurs at Simon the leper's, or some would say a jar merchant's house, because the word for leper and jar merchant in Aramaic are very similar, except for the vowel markings. It's very unlikely that a leper would have a house inside of a community in ancient Israel. It mentioned the poor. It mentioned the anointing was for Jesus' burial. It mentioned the gospel being preached throughout the world. And notice, this is near the end of Matthew's gospel, and this is near the end of Mark's gospel, connected with his burial and connected with the gospel going out to the world. In Luke, the woman's a sinner. You will notice, just like we have in Matthew chapter 6, in the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us our debts. But in Luke 10, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins. Luke is more of a Gentile emphasis, and he is uh, focusing on something different. The, um, the Jewish emphasis would be more on debt. And the Gentile emphasis would be more on sin. He stood behind Jesus at his feet, anointing his feet with tears and wiping them with her hair. Jesus adds a parable here in Luke that's not in the other Gospels. So it's used as an occasion to teach by a use of a parabolic story. Um, and he chastises Simon for criticizing the woman. 
Forgiveness is a big issue in Luke, which is not even mentioned in Matthew and Mark. In John, which notice it occurs six days before the Passover, Lazar is mentioned connected with the resurrection. So now you have the same story connected with Passover and resurrection. A banquet is mentioned with Martha serving and Lazar, one of the guests. The woman is identified with the name Mary, which is not an uncommon name. She's not so identified in the other gospels. The house is filled with the fragrance of perfume. The betrayer is identified as a thief and the treasurer for the group. Jesus says to let the woman alone and mentions that the perfume was kept for his burial. So you have death, resurrection, a banquet. Um, you have the Passover, which represents deliverance. You have the fragrance of perfume. It's like a spiritual essence going through in this one. So you have the same event, probably. And you have four different stories, two of which are similar, and the other two are very different. What do you make of that? <coughs> Anyone so, want to comment? I, I have a small comment to add here. Um, to me, it, it looks like. Else come back now from oh, somebody's talking? Probably the background in a rehab facility. Oh, okay. So it looks to me, it looks to me that these authors are, are, are addressing different audiences. And uh, because of that, the the story the story seems to change. And at, at times, it looks to me that it's not the same story. I mean, probably this thing happened more than once, and as such, we have uh, as a result we have a different. Um, uh, 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 I mean, we have a different story. We have a different. They are describing probably more than two event, events. And in, in, in one of the texts, we, we have a, dis, a disciple who are, you have an indignation of disciple. They are surprised. And in other texts, you have Pharisees who are surprised. They will say, okay, maybe this, if he was really a prophet, he will know that, uh, he will know that uh, this woman is a sinner. So it, 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 it looks to me that probably the, this, but this this thing, I mean, this situation happened more than once, and as a result, the story, you know, looks like it's, it's, it is changing. And coming back to the text of Bart Herman, I know. My, my question is this: is, sim is simple. Can you how how sure are you? Can you trace these these text to the original author? Is it the original text? Because between what uh, Matthew wrote, Mark wrote, and what we are reading today, is it the same thing? Could there be any changes maybe along the way, scriber and copying, copying, multiple copy? Uh, uh, at the end of the day, we don't have the, the original, I mean, the original uh, uh, text as it was written before. So, and, and, and personally, I will stick to the, to the big pictures instead of getting into the details because no one will, I think, I don't think no, each, whatever site you choose, no one will have a, a good reason or, or any good argument uh, to explain why do we have all these apparent contradiction. Okay, good. Any, anyone have a uh, conflicting view? I'm gonna get a little debate going here. Hmm. Because frankly, I think, Jules, you jumped ahead too fast. As always. <laughs> That's okay. You're, you're I, I think they can be the same story, but, you know, as you point out, some of them are more for Jewish audience, some are more for Gentile audience. And any event that happens, each of us may take a different main point or theme or focus of what happened and either expand on it or, or, or try and explain it versus what somebody else would do. Um, 
I, I think that happens pretty consistently. Okay. Yeah, you've you've seen that by comparing texts many times, and we've talked about that. Um, let's talk a little bit about Jules' comments about the original autographs. No one has the original autographs, the original documents. They do not exist. They've been, you know, been many, many years, so they've been destroyed over time. But what we do have are copies of copies. Now, what Bart Ehrman focuses in on are Greek. He's an expert on Greek. At one time, I've heard that he was probably the number two guy in the world when it comes to uh, New Testament Greek. Number one being his teacher, who was uh, Bruce Metzger at Princeton. It doesn't seem likely, I would disagree with Jules, that there are different stories, because that just doesn't seem likely that this is going to happen over and over again, unless Jesus had a bunch of groupies following him around and, you know, washing his feet all the time. So it looks like an incident that was interpreted in different ways by different evangelists, the gospel writers, to make different points, which uh, to me seems to be the best explanation. But what does that do for something like inerrancy? You can't take the actual text that we have today, even when we get into, like, for example, um, uh, let's see if I've got it available right now. I will show you, for example, Um, we were in Matthew 26. So let me look at verse 6. Okay. Okay, um, right now I'm in Bible works, so I'm going to have to deal with a Greek text here. I can show you the Aramaic, but um, here's what we do have. If you look over here where I'm pointing my cursor right now, uh, I've got a number of texts up. I've got the ESV, the King James, the several Aramaic translations and a couple of Greek translations. And then I've got the Peshitta down here. So we can, we can look at that. But over here on, on the right side of my screen, you will see an ancient text. So we can get back to some very ancient texts and I have facsimiles of them. We also have facsimiles of the Peshitta, but the facsimiles of the Peshitta, for example, are 10th century. We don't have any second century um, copies of the entire Peshitta that we could just bring up on the screen like this. We don't have any first century documents. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest biblical manuscripts that we have. And those were scribal copies of earlier manuscripts. So there's no original autographs. We do have ancient manuscripts and we do have books that quote the ancient manuscripts. So we can get pretty close to what we think the original said. Um, I think there's an important four steps that we need to go through. The first one is, what does the text itself say? That was my first step. What does the text say? The second step would be, how does the text, when we compare it with something similar, 
like we just did with these four Gospels. How do they relate to one another? For example, I mentioned where it popped up in the gospel story itself. It's significant that Matthew and Mark are near the end. It's significant that John's connected with Passover. It's significant that Luke is connected with the resurrection of Lazarus. Those are significant aspects of the story. Then there are other aspects that are significant. So how do they interrelate? The third step is how do we interpret it then? Because interpretation is different than translation. So when we look at the original text, then and, and part of part two is translation. So what does the text say? How does it relate? How do we translate it? How do we interpret it? So there's there's a, there's at least three steps there that I've mentioned already, maybe four. And then how do we apply it? And that's very important. In other words, the one question I like to ask is, so what? What does, so what? What does the text mean to me? What does it mean? Well, when we look at, and I'll bring it up again so we can uh, actually see it while we talk about it. I have a quote for you. Uh, hang on to that for just a moment. Okay. Thank you. So, for example, when we look at Matthew and Mark, we, we know that Jesus is getting ready to die. So how does that relate to how we deal with that? Are we ready? Can we calmly deal with it? And then what? He knows that this good news is going to be preached throughout the world. So he wants to, the, the writer of Matthew and Mark wants to connect that with this, this episode. That there's something good in this episode that relates to the gospel going out to the world. In Luke, we have <coughs> a woman who is represented as a sinner who is showing tremendous love to the degree that love is overcoming the sin. And that leads to a story about forgiveness. So forgiveness is a big issue in Luke. So how does that relate? to how do we how we use that story how we relate to other people and forgiveness doesn't just mean okay somebody offended me so i deal with it and i forgive them i try to heal the relationship forgiveness means going forward going forward moving on and if you, if you read the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is a book about victory. One of the big sins in the book of Revelation is fearfulness. Giving up. Cowardliness. So a person who believes in Jesus and has faith and trust, trust in God, has the hope of a great future and doesn't worry about the afterlife. All of that is wrapped up in forgiveness. The next thing in John, which is a very spiritual gospel, it's connected with Passover. Passover is about deliverance. Deliverance of the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt overcoming tremendous obstacles, having to move out fast, having to go through the sea, having to go on a 
year journey in the wilderness, having to rely on God, which is connected then with resurrection of Lazarus, a banquet. Martha. Martha is a combination of the word mar in Aramaic, which means Lord, and the female ending, tha, Martha, means lady. The lady who is serving. And Lazar. Lazar means God helps. Lazar is one of the guests. The woman is identified with Mariam or Mary, which is a very common name for women. The house is filled with the fragrance of perfume, which is a spirit, a, an essence. The betrayer is identified as a thief. He's a very religious guy, and he's a trusted financial guy, but he's a betrayer. So there's a reversal of roles there. And Jesus says, let the women alone, and mentions that the perfume was kept for his burial, connecting it again with his death. So how does that relate to how I live? Man, there's a lot of stuff packed in there. That's why I don't worry about anything. I, I have my battles. Sometimes I have several battles throughout the day on the internet. There's a lot of people that like to take me on. That's fine. But I don't worry about anything. When I had strep throat, there was a golden or silver lining in every cloud. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to take a week off from my workouts. And I got rid of a lot of inflammation throughout my body because I was overtraining. So there's good. There's a lot you can learn from these biblical stories if you have a good idea of what to look for. And then you apply it in your life. Because if we're not applying it, you know, it's like one time at a community college where I was teaching, I was getting my ID badge and um, I taught a class there in physical education <coughs> in Taekwondo. And the guy who was giving me the badge says, you know, I really like the philosophy of the martial arts, but I, I don't like the type of training that the martial arts involves. And basically, you know, my thought was, if you don't do the training, you don't understand the philosophy. Don't get it. You think you do, but you don't. So uh, Eric and I were talking the other day about a word which he did a analysis in various forms of Aramaic um, on how this word is used. And the word is Talmid, Talmida, Talmudim. Disciple. A disciple is a learner or a student, but it means discipline, discipline study. So one of the disciplines that I, I teach is before you do anything with a text, study the text. What does it say? And if you have the access, and now with the internet, there's really no excuse not to have the access because it's we have got the comprehensive Aramaic lexicon, and we've got eSword, and we've got all kinds of things where you can get online and, and download information. And if you really want to seriously study, you could get into these texts and find out what the text says. Because as much as I might respect Bart Ehrman and Mike Lacona and Craig Keener, because I've studied all three of them and many others, many, many others, I really don't care what they have to say as much as I care what the scripture itself says. So anyhow, uh, just wanted to dump that out at you and see what your thoughts are. So let's see, who wants to talk? Richard had a quote. Richard, well, I, I just I just thought of one little part of that one little lesson 
uh, with Judas and the woman, and it was some people know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. That's true. And some people will sell their soul uh, for money. So that was just, a, I just, that just sort of popped in my head. That's good. Are there any other thoughts? Because this, this is important stuff. These are very rich lessons here. Well, I guess I think I still believe that if we are going to you, you, you had four questions and uh, and one of those was like you know how how do we interpret them? How can you interpret all these four texts? And to me, you we we might end up having different interpretation because each of those stories have there are lots of different elements in those in these stories so and, and and that's why i tend to believe that you know um i ask myself why is it that matthew and john who were the closest to jesus than mark or luke have different story i mean how are they how can they you know present us different story with different elements lots of factors inside so i i continue to believe that Probably the, this these things happen more than once. Okay, or I want to stop. Maybe, you. yeah, you yeah. Let me stop. finish. Let me finish. I, uh, well, you know, I, no, I'm not going to let you finish. I want you <laughs> to stop you for just a moment. Okay. Because you said something that's very important, and I want to I want to deal with that thought first. Okay. Yeah. Um, you said Matthew and Mark were closest to Jesus. Okay, and you're correct. Matthew and, well, not Matthew and Mark. Matthew and John would have been closest to Jesus. Mark probably never mm -hmm. met Jesus. Yes, I meant to say Matthew and John. Okay, so let's deal with that because that, that's an important point. I don't want to lose it. Um, if a person is close to Jesus, <laughs> like his 12 disciples, how does that differ from somebody like Luke or Mark or Paul or others that never perhaps even met Jesus? But they heard about Jesus later. So can you expand on that thought a little bit? Because that's an important point. Oh, uh, the, the reason why I'm raising that point is because uh, um, I, I tend to believe that when this thing happened, when the lady came and started putting this you know, perfume on Jesus, they were witnessing, they were, they were seeing what was happening, right? So uh, Luke was not there, Mark was not there, and they were inside that house looking at him. And, and to me, uh, to go back and write completely almost different story with different factors inside. To me, it looks, to, it, it looks like I, I, I believe that this thing may have happened more than once. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking a rigid you know, a side as, okay, this is a black and white. I'm just speculating. It could be that this thing may have happened more than once. And that's why you have all these uh, uh, different, uh, uh, not the, the story is not different, but you have lots of elements that you, we found in each in each story, and that's why it, uh, the interpretation will be hard because you cannot have a single interpretation. You, Are there any other explanations? Person. Pardon me. Are there any other explanations other than it could have happened more than once? Well, the, the other the, the other explanation that I'm looking at is who Matthew is talking to, who John is talking to. I mean, to me, probably they are just talking to different audience. And as such, they may have to uh, uh, maybe arrange the text a little bit to fit, you know, to make the audience to understand, to, 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 uh, to send the message. I mean, that's the big, I mean, the big picture is to send a message, big picture. That's why 
I mean, and that's why I don't, I don't like to go into the details because in the details you have the devil. But in, when you look at the big picture, they are trying to send this message. And that's where, that's where I'm leaning on. But right now, it, uh, I, I, it, it could be that, uh, you know, they are talking to a different audience and as such, they are changing the message. And uh, yeah. that's my explanation. Yeah, very much point, very good. Now, I interrupted you on purpose. Where were you gonna go next? Oh no, that was my two. That was uh, that, that 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 were my yeah. That, those those were my, were my two points that I'm. Okay, trying to let me explain. throw this question out to the rest of the group. And if you something pops in your head on this, Jules, you're welcome to go back into it. Are there any other explanations for the differences in these stories? Well, some things are historical, some things are allegorical, metaphorical, who knows? Okay. I mean, you know, like the talking snake. Okay. <laughs> the talking snake. Yeah, like, like in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, anything else? Something that occurred to me is that even though the ancient texts don't say the gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, they don't, they're, they're kind of like left um, anonymous. Well, not anonymous, but, but maybe they, they were, didn't have the title. But anyway, it says according to. So that does that kind of the according to kind of uh, imply that it's to that witness, what they witnessed? Yes. Yeah, it does. And we don't know for sure exactly who wrote it. It's attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they didn't put their name on the document that came later. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Now, can you think of any other rationales um, why the story would have a different emphasis? There's a paradox that I'm looking for. The first hand witness is going to be the strongest witness for the physical reality of what's going on. But not necessarily the strongest witness for what's going on spiritually, because mm -hmm. that may have been developed as people thought about the episode later, as the story was shared and it took momentum, it started snowballing and people started thinking about different aspects of this story. I'm assuming that it's one of them. But it could have been like Jules uh, um, saying it could have been several occurrences. It's a possibility. Personally, I, I lean heavily toward it's one event with four different stories associated with it. Because we will see, I picked one because it was right in line with where we were going in Matthew. Um, the group with airmen picked a different thing about a staff, which to me is not a real big deal. But we could go into other ones. And if we, every time we find that, we come up with, well, there had to be two different times this happened. Uh, after a while, we're going to realize, hey, look, we're just coming up with a rationale as opposed to an explanation. So. For example, if you work with a text, if you take this text and you think about it and you pray about it and you think about the different concepts, forgiveness, resurrection, death, burial, life after death, um, the Passover, freedom, deliverance, all these different things that we've talked about tonight, you will, over time, 
see things that we haven't talked about tonight. They're there, but it's like peeling an onion. There's different layers. And we've talked about, and some of you have heard this numerous times, but I'll repeat it again. Four different levels of interpretation. This is from the, the Jewish method of interpretation. The first level is the Peshat. Sounds a lot like Peshitta, which means simple, pure, straight. In other words, the literal text, whatever it says. The second level is the Remes. Does the text hint at something? The third level is the drash, the storyline in the text. It's like midrash, the story, to expand the meaning of the, of the text. And I think that's where we ended up when we went into Luke and John in particular. And the fourth level, and you'll, spot, you'll find this level more in John than in any of the other gospels, is the sod. Sod means secret. Sod is hidden. You really got to look for it to find it. But it's there. The book of Revelation is almost all sod. Everything you hear about the book of Revelation from these prophecy nuts is nonsense. They don't get it. You have to understand the sod level in order to see it. it's all symbols it's all cryptography it's it's all hidden it's like a secret code and it's done that way for a reason so you have those four levels basic simple the hint the story and the secret that's why when you're studying the text all of a sudden, it's like Eureka, the light bulb lights up, and you're saying, wow, I never saw that before. Where did that come from? Because you were working with the text. The text incubated in your mind and heart and eventually gave birth. All right, I, I'm, I'm done talking. I want to hear from you guys. I didn't even know if my voice would <laughs> last this long tonight because uh, I've been still dealing with the aftermath of the strap. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Anything at all related to what we discussed tonight? Well, I have a, a question. Do we have any uh, reason to know that the actual followers of Jesus wrote these gospels? I mean, do we know that Matthew, the follower of Jesus, wrote that gospel of Matthew? That's a good question. Um, primarily tradition and some church history that goes with it, both Eastern and Western church history, which attributes these gospels to the people that they're named after. Um, and the fact that they circulated in the churches and the congregations and they were accepted as canonical. The four gospels accepted as canonical by virtually all of the followers of Jesus as being written by followers of Jesus. Um, but more critical modern historians challenge the authorship. But traditional historians and the, even in the order in which they're given, modern historians and biblical critics challenge the, the sequence. They think that there's the uh, Q, the Quelle, um, original gospel, and then Matthew and Luke came from that, or Mark and Luke came from that, or Mark was the original. In the Eastern tradition, Matthew's the original um, most of church tradition, Matthew is, is the formative gospel. Matthew is very Jewish, and uh, Mark and Luke are a little bit less Jewish in their emphasis, 
John was considered to be very Greek because the Greek version starts off with en ho logos, and logos is a big deal in the Greek philosophy, but uh, in Aramaic, milta is, uh, is a big deal in the Eastern Aramaic tradition. So modern scholars are looking at John as being also very Semitic rather than Greek. I don't know if that, did yeah. that help? Yeah. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> yeah, regarding the, regarding the issue of uh, it being four different events, like we were, you know, which was pointed out earlier, um, when you consider that Mark is actually a shorter version of Matthew, that I think rules that out, that it's some separate event. It's just a different telling of the same event, maybe a shortened version or a different version of the same event. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you consider John in his gospel is the mystical gospel showing the showing us the Christ in Jesus. You have again the same event, but yet that being the purpose, you know, looking through that lens. So it's, again, it's the same event, not a fourth event. So that comes to my mind. Good. That's, that's good observation. Also, there's really no big contradiction between the four stories. There's just different details. Right. Yeah, I think the problem erupts when, much like the original premise with Dr. Ehrman's thing, is when you insist it's this way or that way. Um, you know, there's more, there's more gray areas in the Bible than we'd probably like to admit. It isn't all black and white. Um, when people, I mean, evolution, animals and humans seem to have evolved over the, over the years, over the decades. I don't know how God created us. I'm not saying we evolved from apes or anything else, but when a Christian says evolution is false, well, it's, you can scientifically prove it a lot of different ways. It's when you take those definitive stances that it has to be this way that I think you're making errors in however you're reading the text and applying it. It's just never quite that simple. Yeah, and genre means a lot when you're looking at text. The Bible is not written like a scientific treatise. Aramaic and Hebrew do not lend themselves as languages very well to science as much as Greek and Latin do. That's why even people in Aramaic and Arabic and Greek, I'm sorry, and uh, Hebrew speaking lands will use Latin and Greek for scientific terminology. It's much more precise. It's more detailed. There's a lot of flexibility in the Semitic languages, which is good. And that's why guys like Einstein went beyond the science of their time because of the flexibility in the way they were trained in their thinking. Any other comments? Well, my thought was if you take everything literally, then then you have to challenge a scientific interpretation, which is what they do, which is why, you know, we have this evolution museum and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, right. I mean, if, if, if you're taking everything literally, then how is you're going to rule out science? So it's yeah. faith versus heart. I would go um, in a little different direction. I agree with what you said. With this exception, the literalness that they're taking is usually based on the English translation that they're using. Mm. For example, I've heard people say, and I love these people, Genesis says that God created the earth in three days. Days. Days are 24 hours. He created the earth in, in three 24 hour and six 24 hour days. Then he right. rested on the seventh day. Okay. Or the three days and nights that Jesus was in the tomb. Three 24-hour periods. 
they talk like that and they believe that way. But what they don't understand is this. They don't understand the idioms for three days and nights in Semitic languages. <laughs> that that well, that's a good point. Does not necessarily mean literally. They don't understand the idiom of 40 days. And they don't even understand the meaning of the word yom, which is translated day. Because we could have the same word for the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is when the Lord returns in glory. Right. The day of the Lord is when his kingdom is established. So they can mean different things. It can mean a thousand years, according to one text in the Bible. A thousand years is a day. So they use this stuff, and then they, they in their minds, they literalize it somehow. And then they use it for prophetic um, interpretations, etc. So a, a scientist or even a, a grade school student would say, now, wait a minute. The sun's not even created yet, and the stars aren't created yet, and the moon's not created yet. How could it be, how could the first day be 24 hours? How do you establish 24 hours? So it, it doesn't make sense scientifically. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we read that genre? And that's what that book that you're reading is about. Yeah, it's like they said about Jonah and the whale. You know, he was in the whale for three days. Okay, so why didn't the whale's digestive juices digest them? Right, and it doesn't say whale. You, you will hear over and over again, Jonah and the whale, but the the it says fish. A whale is not a fish. Oh, well, jo yes, fi a great fish. But I mean, it, it does say, it does say that Jonah was, what if it said Jonah was in a pickle? Have you ever been in a pickle? I've been in a pickle. Yeah. Up a creek without a paddle and yep. See, that's an idiot. Have you ever seen it rain cats and dogs? That's a good point. You know, there's so many idioms that are in this. Lamza wrote a book with a thousand idioms in it, demonstrating all these different idioms throughout the scriptures. And um, many fundamentalists just totally ignore that which is really unfortunate because then you know what happens? And this is where I was going with your comment. Then in fact, they are not reading the Bible literally. They think they are, mm -hmm. but they're not because they're not identifying the idiom. You have to identify the idiom. You have to identify the symbol in order to understand the literal meaning. Well, how many people are willing to go that deep, for God's sake? Some people don't even know what's going on in the news. You know, like they say, the, it, it, history is written by the winners. Right. And here we are trying to go and outthink or go deeper than what the winners who put this stuff together and say, you know, you guys are a little off here. Then they should just be nice to one another. If they just followed two rules. Love God, you know, and whatever you're identifying God as, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's that's what they need to know. That's what they need to practice. They practice that, the world would be a much better place. Well, agreed. And Jules, I apologize to you for interrupting you so abruptly earlier, but I wanted to extract from your brain where you were going on that one point. All right, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> so that was a good extract. <laughs> I like it. It's all right. <laughs> all right, anything else before we wrap it up? All right, just meditate on this for just a few moments. These concepts, ideas like re resurrection, forgiveness. And be blessed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. See everybody later. Okay. Bye. See you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.